So we are going to have an academic uh, feast, I hope. Uh, this is regarding ILD, and the question is why ILD? Why I thought about uh, when I was asked to do some kind of academic program. So I went back to my MD days, you know, where we, CT scans were not there. And I don't remember having diagnosed ILD very often. And subsequently, I started practicing pulmonary medicine at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in 1991. And I distinctly remember Moray and Nadal 2000 edition, or even earlier that. It clearly said ILD was almost equated to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and treatment was corticosteroids. 1 to 2 milligram per kilogram body weight. And we have come a long way. We have actually dissected ILD in so many ways with the advent of CT scan, histology. The biopsy was almost non existent. So that's what I thought that we'll discuss today. And it's heartening to see very young people, you know, who are doing PGs or post PGs. And we have an amazing faculty. My job initially is to just set the ball rolling, is to describe a clinical approach, which is going to be very basic. So I start with the case of 55 years old gentleman, hypertensive smoker, with, who came with progressive dyspnea, recent limitation of daily activity, non-productive curve, occasional wheezing, some response to bronchodilator, he also had history suggestive of asthma, but on examination he was not dyspneic. And when I examined him, he had bilateral crepitation and bronchi. So when the X-ray was done, of course there is hyperinflation along with uh, uh, an experienced person will make out there are some reticulations. So this is the time way we used to practice some time back when the CT scans were not there. And so what could be the consideration? Does he have COPD, congestive cardiac failure, or he has ILD? So how should we proceed? Whether PFT with BDR and diffusion capacity, six minute walk test, which has become a routine. But actually what we do is the CT scans. And in the same patient when we did the CT scan, it showed the uh, classical honeycombing and uh, the ILD is written, so any PG would diagnose, yes, this is the advanced case of ILD, probably idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, looking into the ST, but he also has hyperinflation. So he had no comorbidity, no history of occupational or environmental exposure, no drug associated with ILD, and the rheumatolo initial rheumatological workup was uh, negative. So how do we achieve histological diagnosis? Do we do bronchoscopy? We will discuss all these things during our panel discussion. Do we do wet biopsy? Extremely rarely we do that now. We, we actually did that during the initial days when the, our chest surgeons were very enthusiastic. Open lung biopsy are almost obsolete. And majority of time we depend upon the HRCT. And if you see the HRCT, Savina will be describing there are reticular shadows that you see. There is bronchiectasis, which is attraction bronchiectasis, and this is the honeycombing. These are the few signs, but you will see much more uh, with the radiology. So, when you see a patient with ILD, what are the facets? How do you go about it? And as I said in the beginning, the ILD was equated to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and the book that I follow is Murray and Nardal shows in the center a UIP. And around that, so many things are there. Would be connective tissue disease, drug, drug reaction, infection, cellular NSIP, hypersensitivity. And we are all scared of fibrotic NSIP. When we see a fibrotic NSIP, we say, oh my God, how do I treat it? And that's what we are going to discuss. So I'm not, this is a classification of interstitial lung disease from DPILD of unknown cause, to idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, to granulomatous, and then some form of congenital uh, interstitial lung disease. I have no time to go into the details of it. You can go it from the, but clinical approach. 
would depend upon the primary care physician, the pulmonologist, the radiologist, the pathologist. Everybody has to be involved from history to radiology to pathology. And uh, if I could share my experience at the All India Institute when we started in pulmonary medicine, quite a few, I would say 80, 90 percent were actually treated as tuberculosis before they presented to us, but n not anymore. The awareness is there and a lot of cases are actually diagnosed and then come to the specialist for further workup. So you have to look at the age. If it is more than 55, IPF is more likely. The younger patient may have sarcoidosis and other diseases. If the male, then IPF is more likely, but nothing is absolute. In females, LAM, sarcoidosis, and CTD becomes important. If the person is smoking, then RBILD or discriminative interstitial pneumonia, PLCH, and pulmonary hemorrhage and good pasture syndrome. Of course, exposure history, silicosis, coal workers, and so on and so forth. Occupation is extremely important. I have to go faster. And if the family history is there, and these are the syndrome like familial IPF, hermansky pudluck syndrome, tuberous sclerosis, lamb Boucher's disease, and other symptoms, like if the hemoptysis is there, then, then good pasture and Wagner's. And if the pneumothorax is there, then LAM and LCH. And if the pleural effusion is there, you think more about CTD and SLE. So these are some few things. So the history is very important. Physical exam, general physical examination is extremely important. Never, I would suggest to the young lads, never just when the patient comes, don't put, on, put the CT and then start asking the question. If you want to learn clinical medicine, pulmonology, please take the history, examine them, make up your mind what this patient be suffering from and you will become a... We'll discuss physiology and there's nobody better than Dr. Chabra who is with us on physiology. Classically, it shows restrictive ventilatory defect without airway obstruction and diffusion capacity and uh, alveolar arterial oxygen difference is exemplified by a six minute walk test, which has become a routine. And there are some ILDs which are associated with airway obstruction, such as hypersensitivity pneumonitis, RBILD, lymphangiomatosis, and LCH and sarcoidosis. In some cases, the diffusion capacity is disproportionately reduced. That is scleroderma, and of course, reduce maximum inspiratory and expiratory pressure with polymyositis. We have come a long way in investigation of the connective tissue disease. And whenever there is a discussion on CTD, ILD, the people are very interested because this is an area where you can actually diagnose and treat uh, effectively. And I did not go into all this. Histological diagnosis, and we'll talk about it during panel discussion. As I said, that open biopsies are obsolete. Even wet biopsy are almost not there, and Manoj will tell us how to take a bigger sample with the bronchoscopy as we discuss. So this patient did not have any comorbidities, and then he was diagnosed as IPF, and we'll discuss the treatment. The case two was a 51 years old male, diabetic with hypothyroidism, progressive dyspnea, and he had early clubbing and expiratory crepitation, and connective tissue markers was negative. His vital capacity of 45 percent and diffusion capacity was 46 percent. This was the CT scan. As you can see that there is little bit of peripheral sparing and you can see a lot of interstitial shadows, little bit of ground glassing. There are uh, microcystic changes also. There is traction bronchiectasis also. So anybody would say that, okay. And there was a fibrosis and little, little honeycombing you can also see here. So if you ask Savina to ask what, is, what does this patient have, he would say this is NSIP. I don't know whether he'll agree with me, but we'll ask him. So when the biopsy was done of this patient, this was a UIP pattern. So at times, you would be required to do a biopsy, whether you do a cryobiopsy. The TBLB is not, not of choice when you, there's fibrotic NSIP or UIP is suspected. We'll discuss about that. So diagnosis was UIP, IPF. So the lung biopsy required in very, very occasional, rare cases where you are in doubt. 
and case 3 was 34 years old lady who had classical cases of uh, scleroderma and this right in front of you digital ulcer deformed terminal phalanges this is something which which interests uh, the pulmonologist as well as uh, so this was the ct scan classical nsi fibrotic nsip and uh, case 4 is the, i have to go faster so that you know i don't eat into and then another was a 63 years old male with a gradual progressive dyspnea and and this is a classical case of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which you can see a lot of nodule, a lot of mosaic attenuation, head cheese appearance, and as per the Indian data, 47% of ILDs are actually HP. And we in practice, actually, we are saying a lot. And case five is a classical case of sarcoidosis. I have to stop here so that, you know, we have time for this. So this was a bit of introduction of uh, how do we approach interstitial lung disease? So when you have a patient with a suspected of ILD, you have to take a detailed history, do an X-ray. But nowadays, we, I have a low threshold for getting a CT scan done uh, without contrast. And HRCT has become a routine when you are in a suspected ILD, and then the clinical approach is there. 